It's the Locked On Flyers podcast for Thursday, February 1st, your daily dose of Flyers news, analysis, and high quality content that is excited because we're kicking off draft coverage. Yeah, always, always fun. Your Locked On Flyers, your daily podcast on the Philadelphia Flyers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, and thanks for making Locked On Flyers your first listen every day. I am Rachel Donner. You can find me on the app formerly known as Twitter at rmiriam. I'm here as always with draft expert Russ Cohen, who's on all your favorite social media apps at Sportsology. We are at Locked On Flyers on Instagram, Threads, Blue Sky, and Twitter as well. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your best bet of $5 or more wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. You can find us over on YouTube, on the SiriusXM app, or anywhere you listen to podcasts. Subscribe to get our latest episode as soon as it's available here on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Uh, Russ, we are going to get into, you know, kind of a, a big picture look at the upcoming NHL draft. Um, plus, we're going to dig into your rankings and talk about Tej Aginla. Uh, today, we do have a little bit of flyer stuff to talk about first. Uh, we did not get a chance on yesterday's show to talk about the update on Carter Hart and the news coming out of London, Ontario. Uh, TSN confirmed that the charges were going to be filed, uh, including against Carter Hart uh, as part of that alleged incident that occurred in June of 2018. And um, I think that kind of you know, dots that I and crosses the T in terms of Carter Hart's done with the Flyers. But yeah, it the certainly Flyers seems that way. way. Yeah, and maybe we'll get more um, from Gary Bettman at the All-Star game. Maybe we won't, but it does seem that way. And, you know, I, I think that was the thought process all the way through. Uh, I think from the organization standpoint on how they, you know, stacked up their goaltending to, you know, as it, as it turned out the other day. So I think... I don't think any of it's a surprise. No. Uh, according to Rick Westhead on TSN, um, one of the interesting things about the Canadian legal system and you know their processes, uh, he do doesn't think, according to the legal experts that he talked to in Ontario and the London area specifically, that a trial wouldn't be until 2025 at the earliest uh, due to the court backlog that they have there. So this is going to be a very long drawn out process. It is very likely um, that none of these guys will see NHL ice until that trial is complete. Yeah. I mean, at the very minimum, like that's, that's, I would think that's the case. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, it, the, we'll learn more on Monday with the press conference from, from London, Ontario, but I think that kind of seals the deal in a lot of ways. Yes. I mean, that's, you know, all you can do is move on. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, in the meantime, Travis Konechny is the Flyers representative to the NHL All-Star Game this weekend. Tonight is the player draft. Uh, they have brought that back for this year, if you recall, and there are the four different teams uh, that are team captains. They've got an assistant captain and a celebrity co-captain. Uh, they're trying to, to bring back that uh, fun atmosphere. And so we've got Team Matthews, Team McDavid, Team McKinnon, and Team Hughes, which Jack is injured and is not playing, but is still going to be there in person. So Jack and Quinn are kind of co-captaining mm -hmm. this situation, which I think is kind of cool. Um, but I'm trying to figure out which of these captains is most likely to pick Travis Konechny. You know, I did. I attended the uh, the game when they did this the first time in uh -huh. Ottawa. Uh, people who go to my YouTube, the Russ Cohen YouTube, and see I have a video with Claude Giroux talking about the results. And as Phil Kessel walks behind him, uh, he was the last guy picked. So you really don't right, know right. how this is going to go, right? And 
even from what I remember, and Giroux is a young player. He was picked pretty late. So Konechny's going to have to wait his turn. My guess is, is that the Hughes will take him because they know him from the East. That's my guess. Yeah, I would think so. But I kind of secretly hope he ends up on Team McKinnon. I think him on a team with McKinnon and Cal McCarr would be a lot of fun and sure. to mix it up like East and West. But we'll see. Maybe maybe Austin Matthews and Morgan Riley will pick him up. Uh, it's possible. We'll I see. mean, I don't know of any connection between any of them. So we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. The the draft is at 6 p.m. Eastern on ESPN2 and it's on Sportsnet in Canada. So looking forward to on tomorrow's show talking about what team he winds up on and uh, potential competitions, et cetera. Uh, in the meantime, we're talking NHL draft. It's February 1st, and it seems like it might be a little early, but it's never too early. This is when uh, some of the rankings start to come out that are a little more refined, taking world juniors into consideration and mm -hmm. all of that. And it's kind of kicks off the prospect season, so to speak, leading up to next summer. And so that's why we do it this early. And especially given that Russ is a draft expert and a prospect guy. Uh, so, you know, we'll, we'll get the jump on it as Russ does every year. So, like, what is your process and thoughts on rankings in general from year to year? Yeah, so I've started to do them earlier just because of the way the public wants them. Uh, my ideal time would be just to wait until after uh, the top prospects game and the world juniors, but you can't seem to do that anymore. So uh, you look at the beginning of the year and you really, the first big thing after the start of the season is the world juniors. World juniors is a big part of the grade because that's high competition. You want to see how the player um does as far as being dropped into another situation where maybe he doesn't even know those players or line mates and see how they do. That's an important um, aspect in trying to figure out is a player adaptable and those kinds of things. Then you look at the all-star games, like the all American and the top prospect and it's, and it gives an opportunity for some of the lesser stars to usually shine in those games, like guys you may have overlooked. And then it's good to go back and, you know, cause I have a lot of draft sheets or I have videos tagged, on Instat, and I can go back and look at those. So it gives you, you know, that opportunity to do that. Now, uh, in a week, I'll be at the Five Nations, and that's a big deal. So that's, again, uh, going to tell you, or I think it's the Four Nations now, but whatever, four or five, who the heck knows? I'll be there. But the point is, it's an important tournament, and that's something where uh, I'll do another rankings after that. You know, I'll see a certain amount of games of that and see how some of those players look. Some of the euros that could change my mind on some of the euros. The American team will be there too, but it's another important one. Then you still have the season playoffs, Memorial cup, and then you still have the Holinka at the end of the year, you know, before the draft at the end of the season, I should say. Um, so, and sometimes world championships, remember sometimes, Last couple of years, some draft oh, right. guys have played in the world championships too. So, you know, if Macklin Celebrini plays in the world championships, you know, I'm going to watch it. He's still the number one. Uh, as we're recording, he had another good game uh, for BU that I watched recently. So not worried about him, but, but that's, you know, that's the process. And then what I try and do is figure out um, where players are going to play. Is this guy a first liner, second liner, third liner, first pair, second pair, that kind of thing. And then I end up doing it in um, in like a challenge mode, kind of like for the uh, every three or four picks, wherever I feel like there's a drop off. So like there's Celebrini and then there's everybody else in this draft. So then, you know, I would say two to four is another area where I think it has a, a battle point. And then I think five to ten and then so on and so forth. I haven't figured out all the others yet. And there's probably still going to be changes even in the second one that I have put out, but that's how I sort of do it. And uh, right now I'm still only doing 32. I might extend it to 45. It's a, it's a pretty good draft. I, you know, I don't want people to get the idea that it's not a good draft. When I say, I think there's only one number one center that I could see so far. And that's Celebrini. Or if I say, I don't know if any of them are number one defensemen, but there's a few that definitely have a chance. That doesn't mean it's not a good draft because I think the draft has a load of players. 
I, that just means some of those kind of special franchise players aren't as, you know, obvious in this one. I think that's, you know, what, what I'm talking about. So when people are looking at rankings in general, like what grains of salt should they be thinking about when they're looking at these lists from yeah. various sources, whether it's you or somebody else? Yeah. So most players are a work in progress at this age. So, you know, Celebrini, you could look at and say that he's still going to get better, but there is no grain of salt to take with him. He plays a complete game. So he is what he is. Um, grain of salt, like, you know, a player like Ivan Demidov, who, uh, has been jumping around between the MHL and the KHL. Sometimes the numbers you have to look at and kind of understand. If there's players from the Q, you have to understand where those high numbers come from. If there's players um, in college, you kind of have to look at what conference they're in and who they're playing. You know, those kinds of things do play into it too. Um, and again, now, we're you know, in this draft and in the last couple drafts, we're getting guys that are playing in college as true freshmen, which is hard to do. So that, to me, always gets a, a pretty good ranking uh, if they're a good player because that's something where, yeah, that's not easy to do. As an example, if you're playing as a true freshman or you're playing in the MHL, like obviously it's harder to play as a true freshman. It doesn't mean I ignore your play, your your numbers from the MHL, but it's a much tougher league. That's, right. you know, that's what I'm getting at with that. And then, yeah, you have to, you know, figure out the Euros. I always try and um, give them their fair shake because it's harder. It's harder to figure out the Euros. There's not as many viewings Absolutely. that we get. Um, and so, you know, and of course we can watch their games and such, but I, I like to get viewings in person too. And so I don't have the opportunity. I mean, this year I'm going to have some opportunity and that's good. Some years I don't get as much. So I take all that into account because it's easy uh, to show a bias. Like, I'm, you know, I'm covering a lot of these U.S. games. It would be easy for me to show a bias for them, but I do my best not to. All right. Well, there's so much more to get into in terms of this draft class overall and Russ's initial rankings, or I guess I should say 2.0 rankings because you did mention the earlier ones and we will get to that coming up next. Happy Super Bowl to all who celebrate from FanDuel, America's number one sports book. If you're like me, Super Bowl Sunday is all about scoring the best seat on the couch grabbing your favorite football snacks, and placing some super bets. I do think I'm going to put out a, a, me <clears throat> a menu this year. I do. It's not going to be extensive. It's not like a restaurant menu, but I am a hotel restaurant major, and so I do have a little flair for that sometimes. Uh, but for this Super Bowl right now, I, I kind of – I'm still leaning towards the 49ers. I know everybody says, don't bet against Patrick Mahomes, but you know what? Brock Purdy's been really good, and Brock Purdy scored a lot of second-half points recently, so I just – I, I feel pretty good about the overall team for the 49ers. Sometimes you still have to remember there's a team that can sit, take into consideration. FanDuel has so many ways for you to end the season with a W or two or three. Not only can you bet on who will win the Super Bowl 58, but FanDuel also has bets for which players will score a touchdown, how many points will be scored, and so much more. New customers join today and you'll get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. Just visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn to sign up. That's FanDuel.com slash LockedOn. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NFL. Like I said, on tomorrow's show, we're going to talk more about the All-Star game coming up and look at what the first week back looks like for the Flyers as well. Uh, continuing our draft kickoff. So in terms of this draft class overall, like how would you judge the quality compared to past years? I, I think that the, like the overall quality is good. Like if I think... Last year's um, was like a, a B plus. I think this one's like a B minus. You know, I think it's like that. Um, I think there's a lot of defensemen in this one. Um, on this one, I have five defensemen in the top 10. At one point, I think I had six. So that's sort of, you know, been bandied around. And it's not just because teams need defensemen. They still have to be good enough to kind of be in there. It's just that some players lately have really shot up for me, like Z Booham, who uh, Booham is really doing great in college hockey. Like for a true freshman, besides right. what he did in the World Juniors, like he to me, he's just been terrific. And and Jesse Polkinen, who not a lot of people have as high, 
I don't know, man. He's six foot seven. He's doing well, and he's got some moves for a six foot seven guy. So I just have a feeling he um, he may continue to rise. Uh, you know, the next thing is a lot of people are going to be looking for forwards, and it's like every other draft. There's a lot of guys that say they play center or say they play center and wing, uh, but the ones that truly play center, I think, are going to be, you know, a little bit light in this one. Definitely no um, first liners that I can see beyond Celebrini, but it doesn't mean like if Constant Hellenius continues on his arc, he couldn't be a first line center. He could be. And there still could always be one hidden in, you know, middle to late first round. You never know. Sometimes when you see players, you know, the development is great from year to year. So there is always that. There's a, you know, there's a, a decent amount of centers, but it's not like a, you know, a star studded cast for that. But there's a lot of good forwards, a lot. And I have picked out a fair amount of guys who I think can play center um, in that first round. And I think teams are going to do the same thing because I still think at the end of the day, you're looking for defense and you're looking for right. centers most, most often. Right. Yeah. It's a, uh, it is interesting because of where the flyers are in this upcoming draft in that maybe they would have focused on um, either a center or a defenseman. Like you were just saying, they just picked up Drysdale in, in that trade. Are they going to be more focused on centers now? I know the flyers and most teams say, you know, you take the best available player in your your list you know your teams have their rankings and um but i i do wonder if you know what you're saying about maybe the lack of of strong top line centers here is going to push the flyers maybe in a different direction well i mean some sometimes teams take out a need that you know it's not always true so you're right about that i think uh in their situation even though they got trysdale I don't think any center they get is, you know, a year away. So I still think two to four years for a lot of these defensemen, even the good ones. So I think, I still think they're going to end up going defense first and then, then go the center after that. I think that's going right. to be the strategy because I don't think there's anybody that would come up or fall. Like, I don't think Hellenius would fall past 10. Uh, I don't think... Uh, Berkeley Catton gets, I have him at 11. He may not even get to that. So in reality, so I don't think there's anybody else that would make them say, all right, we've got to grab this guy. Cause we think he might be a top line center. So I think with defense, you're dealing with a position of strength and that's where I think you should go. Like with that first pick is what's the draft strongest that get that. Right. And you mentioned the tiers that you have in terms yeah. of you have Celebrini and then you have, you know, two to five and then yeah. five to 10, these different breaks. Like how deep do you think this draft goes before it just becomes kind of a mush and, you know, you don't have these more top, you know, potential picks? Yeah, I, I think really through 32, it's pretty strong. Um, I have Michael Haig at 32 and he's a guy that was injured last year and is really coming on this year for Chicago. And, you know, he looks like a second line center quality player to me. So I, I think it goes pretty deep. Uh, you know, if you get Will Skayen, he's a big, strong defensive defenseman. Uh, we know that there's at least one president of a hockey team that likes those guys. Um, mm -hmm. And so I would say that, He's not alone, and other guys are going to be looking at him too. And his father is a um, strength and conditioning coach, uh, I think currently with BC, uh, but used to be in the NHL for that. So this kid's in great shape, and he's a big guy who can punish people. So And he's a really good skater. So you look at those things and you say, all right, yeah, that guy's probably not getting out of the first round. So, and expect, you know, a fair amount of Euros. Um, there could be more uh, checks than I have in there. That's what I'll find out, you know, at the tournament next month. So just looking at it that way, uh, it's good through 32. That's really good to hear, especially because the Flyers do have or is, are most likely to have two first round picks in right. this upcoming draft. Um, 
you know, just looking at your list in general. And by the way, there will be a link to Russ's list in our show notes on um, his website, as well as um, my favorite thing I did to do every year. And that's my uh, draft prep spreadsheet for y'all. Um, it's already underway. There'll be a link in our link tree as well. And we'll pin it to socials uh, where there'll just be a list of all of the draft profiles that we've been doing and what episode they uh, were talked about on. So if you're interested in our takes on anybody we've talked about so far, you can do that. Um, and then we'll just keep adding to it as we continue these draft profiles. Yeah, that's great. I mean, those those kinds of things are a really valuable resource. I think it's good. It helps the um, fans know some of these players, at least on a basic level, get an idea, see who you're rooting for, start watching yeah. maybe you know what you can on NHL Network end of the season and start getting attached to players that your team won't take. Like, Just get used to that. Yeah, I feel like that was a call out, Russ. <laughs> I feel like it might have been. <laughs> that is, oh, it's it's such a problem for me. I love all these kids. I love them equally, and then they go other places that I don't like, and I am sad. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it, it is it is the burden I must bear as yep. a hockey fan. But uh, yeah, so there's like some names we've already talked about, like way back in November, we did kind of a way early look at things. We talked about like four or five different guys. So there'll be a link to that episode in our spreadsheet as well. And then we're going to revisit some of those guys as yeah. we get closer and closer to the draft uh, so that you can see if anything's changed with them which will be uh, really cool to see. Uh, in the meantime, we want to keep that going and talk about Tej Aginla, who has a name that t does sound familiar. Locked On has launched the first ever National Sports 24 streaming channel on YouTube. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league like Locked On NHL. Go to Locked On Sports Today on YouTube and subscribe. So, Russ, I wanted to talk about Tej Aginla, um, mostly because of the name factor, but also because... Like, you can't make assumptions with kids who are children of famous NHLers. And um, he does have, you know, some similarities to dad, Jerome Ginla, but not all. I think, you know, he's definitely not as physical. He doesn't play on as much of an edge as Jerome uh, did. He's a forward, left-handed shot. He doesn't turn 18 until August. Um, he's just shy of six feet and latest I saw he's about 182 and he's in sort of the 14 to 16 range right now but that could be rising and uh, he's currently playing in the WHL which is one of the most interesting junior leagues to me um, on the Kelowna Rockets yeah he's doing really well he had a nice um, top prospects game 65% uh, mm -hmm. of his shots are, are hitting the net which is really good he's smart uh, he will use his body. He will, you know, he doesn't shy away. He's pretty good on face-offs. I don't know if he's really a center. We'll see. Uh, he's got a very quick release on a shot. Uh, I do think, you know, he gets to play with uh, Cristal, who definitely helps him get some points. Right. But I think, but I think he gets him on his own too. He's quick to lose pucks. Uh, he is definitely one of the smarter players. Uh, has one of the best smiles, like Jerome McGinley did. <laughs> but you know, I do think his dad is has helped him in the sense that he's made him very comfortable around hockey, and I think that's good. But I also know his dad a little bit from a lot of interviews, and know that he's definitely not the overbearing type or the type that would overcoach his kid. So I think I think you're seeing just the right uh, amount here being used with him, and you could tell. Yeah, um, you mentioned the CHL top prospects game. He was named player of the game on his squad. You know, they split into a, a red and white team. And so he yeah. was the player of the game on on his side of things. And um, so that was good to see. 
Um, his scoring has increased tremendously this year over last year. Last year, he played for the Seattle Thunderbirds in the WHL, and that team went to Memorial Cup, and there, it, that team was just stacked. And, it was. you know, with Aginla being a year younger last year, there just wasn't room for him in the lineup. So he didn't get to play as much. He only played 48 uh, regular season games um, and didn't play at all in the Memorial Cup. Um, so I think he just kind of got boxed out there. He moved over to Kelowna and right now he's played in 42 games and has 57 points, uh, 32 goals, 25 assists. That's, uh, not too shabby. No, I mean, you know, it's a really good year to point out though. Um, right now, Andrew Cristal has 77 points in 40 games for Kelowna. So he's certainly shared a year in some older of that. though. Yes. No, and I'm just pointing out that he's definitely shared in some of that yeah. offense. There's no way around that. But uh, I do think uh, I like his zone entries. I think his speed is already good. Jerome Ginla was kind of, to me, a little bit of a late bloomer, and that's why Dallas traded him, you know? And yeah, yeah. I don't think I don't think Tiege is going to be that. I think he's, like, developing right now, right on time. So that's why... Yeah, it wouldn't shock me if he gets into that 12 to 15 range <coughs> in the draft, like where a team may take him. I think he's definitely um, looks like a second line talent, but as mm -hmm. a center, I that's where I might draw the line and say, oh, I don't know. I don't know if he's a second line center. Definitely a second line winger because I could see the scoring and everything else. Face off stuff, you know, I don't know yet. So I don't know if he'd be a second line center. So that's why I'm not expecting him to be a center. But We'll see how that all works out for him. But, yeah, he uh, he's a fun guy to watch. He has fun playing hockey, so he's one of those guys. He gives a good interview, so teams are going to like that. So he's definitely on, you know, I would say 60% of the team's boards, the ones that yeah. know they have a shot at him. They're gonna be able, he, there's going to be a lot of discussion about him. Right, and... I think that it's important to note that different like NHL projection, depending on what position he plays and, you know, if he wants to be a center or somebody's trying to turn him into a center, like how's this play away from the puck and defensively right now? From what I've seen, it looks pretty good. I haven't seen a ton of that though. I actually need to look at that a bit more, you know, that's, those are things um, that I do sometimes see right away and sometimes I need to see more of. So I'm going to say I need to see more of, but the early part of that seems fine. Um, but young players could always improve there, so it's not a big deal saying he needs some right. improvement there because they all do. Do you think like there's some sort of um, unofficial uh, requirement that Kelowna has some success in the postseason in the WHL and maybe goes to a Memorial Cup in order – for Aginla to move up in the rankings or is no. that kind of independent? No, I think it's independent. Look, it's always nice because if he could have a big, you know, Memorial cup, that would certainly um, make, you know, make a difference. Uh, but I don't think it's going to matter in this case. I think uh, having, you know, knowing who his dad is helps. I don't think it helps every, you know, I don't think it helps him become a top five pick, but when you start looking at all the different check marks, uh, I, I think it's going to help a little bit. So I think he does get an edge on some other guys or at least more views uh, based on that. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Uh, but uh, I, I love the WHL. I think it's a fun league. It's a great league. And I, I think it's rising in its stature in terms of developing prospects and, and having draft success. So uh, definitely a league to keep an eye on. Tija Ginla is a player to keep an eye on, and we will continue doing so. Uh, like I said, there will be a spreadsheet linked in our link tree and on our socials so that you can find all of our draft evaluation coverage that we'll do and pretty much weekly uh, through the uh, NHL draft this summer. It, it doesn't seem like it's close, but the time flies. Time is a flat circle, as they say. Yeah, so we'll does. be there before you know it. Uh, yeah, that will yeah. do it for today's show. Tomorrow we are going to talk more All-Star Weekend and then have a look ahead to when the Flyers return to action. 
as a reminder, we always want to hear from you. If you've got mailbag questions, you can send them in via Twitter at Locked On Flyers. You can email us at Locked On Flyers at Gmail or comment over on YouTube. I'm Rachel. I'm on Twitter at R Miriam. That's R M I R I A M. I'm Russ. I'm at Sportsology, S P O R T S O L O G Y. Have a great day, everyone.